for uh, tearing yourself away from your cafe lattes and your breakfast buffets uh, to join us here. It is, in fact, the 40th uh, <coughs> Art Basel, and this is the last uh, Art Basel conversation. And I want to thank uh, Art Basel itself for adding a little bit of intellectual or whatever stimulation uh, to what appears to have been some commercial stimulation over the last uh, uh, week or so. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists in more uh, detail as we go along, but just so you really understand who's sitting on the stage, they're sitting in the same order as, as you see it up, up there. So furthest to your left is Irona Blaswick, Christine Marcel from Paris, Lars Nitwe from Stockholm, Nicholas, Nicholas Schaffhausen from Rotterdam, and Adam Weinberg, the token U.S. Museum Director to my right. Uh, thank you for being here today and for joining us for this conversation. It is going to be mainly a conversation and I'm going to shut up soon. Uh, so let me just say a few words about why we're here. The, uh, the theme, as you know, is institutions, a time of crisis and opportunity, question mark at the end of the word opportunity. Uh, I think it's a very, very timely uh, theme for us. Uh, not just for, uh, it's not just a, a big question mark for the commercial part of the art world, but also for uh, museums. Uh, I think uh, even though uh, this morning's, uh, even the Financial Times is now talking about green shoots in the economy, and even though uh, there have been relatively positive signs, even from this fair about uh, the art market, uh, you really have to have been living on Mars uh, in the last two years to believe that something hasn't changed uh, quite fundamentally. And for the foreseeable future, I think uh, institutions everywhere are going to be operating uh, and adjusting to different realities than what we have gotten used to over the last decade and a half, maybe with a brief interruption. So this seems to be a great time to talk about new strategies and to think out loud whether perhaps uh, the crisis might have some silver lining uh, in the form of offering some, some new approaches to what we do. Uh, good times uh, tend to breed complacency. Uh, when times are flush and when there's a lot of money around, you can paper over some problems. This is true, by the way, for every family as well. Uh, you can solve, appear to solve some problems with money, and when the funds aren't there anymore, sometimes those uh, uh, problems percolate up. In addition, uh, sometimes when there's a lot of money, you can make decisions that turn out to be problematic later on, as everyone who's had a foreclosed upon house knows, and as many museum directors who have to run <coughs> gigantic museums built by their predecessors know. So uh, uh, crises, by uh, contrast, uh, tend to be times when, under the pressure of the, of the new realities, new ideas come up, new types of people, new types of thinking appear, and innovations happen. We cannot uh, afford not to innovate in these times. The uh, marketing guru Theodore Levitt once said, the absence of a problem leads to the absence of thinking. And if you invert that, if you perceive that you have a problem, you're more likely to be thinking. So, I think, I hope we can offer not just some sort of big picture uh, views on this new moment, but also some practical ideas. But I also would like to think that today might be a time for us to seek out some common ground about how art institutions uh, can run and from what sources they can derive energy. Um, there's no doubt that the United States has been humbled uh, at the time of American arts administrators preaching to Europe about the virtues of endowments and private benefactors uh, may have abated for the time being. Uh, at the same time, I think we also realize that uh, the European welfare state system can't afford to be quite as generous over the long term as it was in the past. So this is a time that we can look at how the two models, the private and public and private funding models, might be able to work together. I'd like to believe that we can become smarter. I'd like to believe that we can have the best of both worlds and that the ladies and gentlemen on our distinguished panels can show us how. Um, Ram Emanuel, the hyperactive uh, chief of staff of President Barack Obama, 
uh, likes to say, and he repeats, the, he repeats this often, he likes to say, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And uh, so uh, in that spirit, I'd like to suggest that we make the most of it. What we, what we will do here today with, with these five extraordinary speakers representing five cities, two continents, five very different institutions, is we will have a little bit of a conversation uh, and since there are so many of us, um, uh, we've been allowed to go a little bit over time, especially <coughs> to make time for questions. I'm almost certain that there will be questions from the audience. And just bear in mind that we are being taped for audio and video, so if you do ask a question, please uh, uh, mention your name or affiliation if you would like. All right, so what I was thinking of doing uh, is uh, basically ask each of our panelists very briefly about what the crisis has meant uh, for them. And I'm going to start with the institutions that have been the most sheltered from the, the, the storm, if you will, which are the publicly supported uh, major European institutions represented here. So that's why I'm going to start with Christine. Uh, you're the chief curator of contemporary art at the Centre uh, Pompidou. Um, you've organized many highly acclaimed exhibitions around the world uh, and, and, of course, in France. You're a critic, you're a, a widely published author, and you, you are representing uh, a, a preeminent institution in a country that takes culture very seriously, supports its major cultural institutions very lavishly. Um, what has this crisis if, meant for you, if anything, <coughs> and what, what changes have you seen at the Beaubourg, and just very briefly, please. Yeah, so the, the case of France is, uh, as you say, very particular because we have a huge support of the state historically, and uh, it's still uh, very uh, important. It has not changed in terms of uh, uh, money support. It has even uh, a <coughs> bit increased last year, generally speaking. Uh, but what I can see that has a big change is our purchasing um, a budget that is a bit decreasing compared to all the uh, budget. Uh, the case also of Pompidou is special because we have like 50% of donators, so it's uh, a very important uh, help for purchasing. And the, the major change, I think, is that we have to look more for our sponsors. It was the case before, but now we have a new strategy in this direction, and we have also new types of sponsors um, involved in our exhibition. Can you just say what you mean by new type of sponsors? Um, I mean, new trademarks, uh, new... Uh, so corporate, these are corporate sponsors. Yeah. yeah people who were not involved so much before in supporting us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, do you get any private donations as well at, at, at the Centre Pompidou? Yeah, 50% of our purchasing is uh, donation. Donations. And the idea of getting more support from these sources, did that originate in the museum or in the ministry, or how do these ideas come up in France? Oh, I mean, it's a huge historical process dealing with our history, and it comes from the French Revolution, actually. It was the idea of making our collection public, and uh, when we got rid of the king, we got rid, rid also of the idea of keeping our collection for, for the elite. And uh, yeah, it's our history, actually, to make it public. But anyway, but right now, for the most part, <coughs> you don't feel any major change in, in your funding from what we you do. We do, actually. We do because uh, it's more difficult, I think, for exhibitions right now. We need to find more money out of the institution because the, the exhibitions are more and more expensive, actually. I don't know why, but <laughs> it's like this. It's like endemic. Um, and so, to, uh, for example, for my last exhibition, the Philippe Pareno, I had to find half of the budget of the show out of the institution. I see. Okay. Good. We'll get back to the, I'm very interested in the, uh, it seems like even in France, things aren't exactly the way we imagine them in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, Lars, you're the other representative of, uh, of a major uh, art institution in a country that, uh, that spends a lot on culture, and you've been there since 2001 at the Moderne Museet in Stockholm. Uh, previously to that, you were at the Tate Modern and the Louisiana Museum and other uh, functions. Lars is, of course, also a curator, art critic, 
including a, a newspaper critic and an author. I can tell you he's the only person, I think, on our panel who has not only worked as a ski instructor, uh, <laughs> but also has a dedicated fan site devoted to him on the internet, which he was surprised to find out this morning, and I will not reveal the, the uh, address, but it's okay. Um, uh, you're working on a number of things. You're working on a new building in Malmo. You've opened a new Renzo Piano uh, gallery. You've started an American Friends of uh, the museum. Um, what does the world look like from your corner of the universe, and what changes, if any, are you having, thinking about? Well, the world looks <coughs> quite terrible, I think, but, but uh, our corner looks okay. I think we, I mean, as a cultural institution, you're always at the tipping point of a crisis. I mean, you balance that point all the time, I think, if you used your, I mean, if you do what you're supposed to do. I think we had our really serious crisis maybe seven years ago, which was a financial uh, PR or public crisis and a fiscal crisis. We even had to close the almost new building for two years to sort of to repair it and to work over it. So, uh, I mean, during that period, we did a major overhaul of our thinking, what we were, what kind of museum we were. And I think we came out as a much faster, more flexible museum. And in a sense, uh, thinking of ourselves as, in a sense, a nomadic museum, even though we moved back to pretty big ba base camp, which is the museum building in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. So during that period, we, we also rethought how we should finance ourselves in the future, because as you say, mm -hmm. we couldn't expect more public funding, most likely, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the future. So we had to look at other income sources, which haven't been the tradition in Sweden, given our tax situation and, and uh, we're a national museum. Uh, right now, we're actually in, in a comfortable, you never are if you run a museum, I would say, and it shouldn't be really. It should be mm -hmm. quite uncomfortable in certain ways because you should always push. But uh, we actually, in, we're in a situation a little bit like the Centre Pompidou, I think, that this year we, for the first time in eight years, we got an increased grant and aid for the gov from the government. Decreased. Increased. 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 Okay. And we actually have slightly more, <coughs> but that's luck. That's not anything but, because it doesn't reflect the situation in Sweden in general. Mm -hmm. We actually have a little bit higher corporate sponsorship than last year. Uh, but that was luck. We, we were focusing on energy companies, working with electricity and energy, and you know they're doing well also in a crisis. So, so therefore, and we sort of moved out of the financial uh, financial system, so to say. So you're in the enviable position uh, that everybody would like to be in in a crisis, which is your finances are sound, maybe you can even spend a little bit on art and of course take advantage of a market that uh, allows you to, to get more. Typically, I mean, yes, uh, I mean, I think that it's a slightly frustrating situation because typically the funding you get from the government and corporate sponsorship and so is for I mean, it's, it's for the running of the museum, for mm -hmm. the exhibitions, for the program, mm -hmm. and not for acquis acquisitions. And mm -hmm. in the last years, definitely the main part of the funds for acquisition have come from private donations. Okay, so that and has they been. may decrease. There is, I mean, there's a tendency that they will go down, mm -hmm. which may mean that we can't use the great opportunity that we definitely have now. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I would think that uh, the cash contributions to the American Friends of the Museum, for example, will go down okay. uh, considerably, while mm -hmm. possibly donations or works of art will continue, mm -hmm. because that's a different game. Right. All right, well, those are two, th that's, that's one type of reality in Europe, and it's, it's, it's great to hear that uh, basically it, it's not business as usual. You're, you're able to continue your commitments much mm -hmm. the same as yeah. before. Now let's look at two organizations which are in a, in a different category, in a different situation, not only because uh, 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 neither one has a permanent collection, uh, uh, but also you're uh, uh, both uh, operating with a, a greater diversity of, uh, so of sources. Uh, uh, Ivona uh, Laswick is a, a actually also a Tate veteran. She was the former head of exhibitions and displays also worked at the ICA in London, and like everybody on this panel, you could say she's a distinguished curator, uh, writer, 
Uh, as an independent curator, she's organized many shows around the world. Also has a very high profile in the London art world as a juror for the Turner Prize and various other uh, functions. We're all on this panel wearing many, many hats. Um, so uh, your uh, organization does rely uh, on private support. There's a whole area on your website dedicated to uh, reaching out to corporate sponsors. Uh, you've also just completed a, a building project. Uh, you're, you're living in a city which is perhaps the hardest hit by the recession among all the European capitals. So tell us how you've had to adjust your expectations and what is perhaps one big change that you've made. Uh, I mean, the Whitechapel, it's, it's over 100 years old, and during that 100 years, it's, it's always, <laughs> uh, you know, fought for funding. And um, we're a Kunsthalle, we don't have a collection, and that makes us, in a way, both agile and fragile, because we can't, we don't have the leverage with other institutions in terms of borrowing works of art. Um, and also, I think that with private giving, um, to be able to associate your name and your gift to a permanent work of art is very, very attractive. So we, mm. have, to, we have to make a different kind of case, really. Mm. Um, but because of that, um, you know, that, that quite tough existence over a century, what we've learned to do is to diversify. We have a very, very broad and diverse income base, mm -hmm. which is both, which is a combination of raised and earned income. And uh, we, it means that we spread our risk, basically. About 30% of our funding is from government. Um, about 30% yeah. is from trusts and foundations, uh, individual givers, and so forth. Uh, a, a smaller percentage is through sponsorship. And then finally, uh, we earn money, as all our colleagues do through publishing and, and um, uh, selling editions and so on and yeah. so forth. So that, that kind of spread <coughs> is quite interesting, because if one bit of it collapses, you're not completely exposed. Yeah. So that's been actually a very interesting way of working. And um, I think there's certain freedoms that come with it. We're not uh, under the control of any political ideology or elite, mm -hmm. um, although Britain has an Arts Council also, which kind of guarantees this sense of the arm's length principle. It does mean that we're not vulnerable in the way that my colleagues say in Italy and Spain are vulnerable to every change of government. Suddenly there's every curator and director, is, is, it's all changed, you know. Um, the, the kind of problem for us will be certainly that trust and foundation um, and the uh, corporate sector is, is very, very wary of looking profligate. Mm -hmm. And it's looking to, it, it's been very hard hit, particularly in Britain. Thousands of jobs have been lost, in, particularly in the financial sector. So it's very difficult now to make a case for supporting the arts. Um, so all of these things are something that we have to look at. But in a way, it's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. We've always been quite, a, you know, a, a fleet of foot organization, but always kind of vulnerable. Mm -hmm. We also are in the least glamorous part of the city. We're in the East End, it's very gritty, there's tremendous poverty in that area. So we've always struggled to get very um, kind of glamorous corporate sponsorship. I think what our offer is, is much more to do with a philanthropic sense, or perhaps of corporate responsibility towards enabling us to serve various audiences which are, you know, economically very, very challenged indeed. So it's a different kind of approach. So do you expect that the next year will be harder though? It, it seems like several of your benefactor uh, sure. areas are still going into the bad trough and not Yeah, our, our income base will, will certainly shrink. Um, but it's something that we're, we're, we're actually, because we're, like all my colleagues, we've benefited from consistent increases mm -hmm. over the recent years. We're able to use that investment, I think, to make our future sustainable. Right. And we're doing that by actually really thinking way ahead. We're thinking three or four years down the road. Um, and we're looking at all sorts of different strategies about how to cope with that, yes. Yeah. One, one upside. Okay. Attendances are going up and up. Attendance is up. Who said? Who has attendance going up in on the panel in their organization, in their institutions? Can I, is, 
Not this year. Attendance not up at the Bobur, do you know? Attendance, do you have a sense of the attendance the trends at the Centre Pompidou? How many people are coming? How much people are coming? Mm -hmm. It's getting better and better. It's getting better I and better. I think the crisis is very positive for us. Uh -huh. Is this a, is this it a general truth? It seems that truth? people think that instead <coughs> of going to the movie, or they, they come to the museum this year uh -huh. much because more. Because it's cheaper or because it's uh, more satisfying? It's satisfied? quite the same price, but I think they, they get a, um, a value from it that mm -hmm. make them feel more comfortable during a crisis time. Adam, it's is that true here? We're, 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 about, we're about level. About um, level, and here? It's a, you know, Rotterdam, uh, it's a completely different situation to work there than in, in a transit city, you know, as a, in a, in a mm -hmm. big city. So we can't count on our local visitors. Mm -hmm. We only count so our tour international visitors, and they are, with, which has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the program, mm -hmm. what we are going to do. Uh, the number well, of well, visitors before, are increasing. Before, before you uh, get into more details, I yeah. do want to say a few more words no. about you, uh, just so <laughs> everybody knows. Uh, Nicolas is just uh, off the boat, practically, from Venice, where he uh, uh, curated for the second time the uh, German pavilion to great uh, acclaim. Um, and he, uh, uh, again, in, uh, uh, represents an institution that uh, is growing and has new plans. Uh, 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 he's a German-born curator. He's had leadership positions around Europe at the Künstlerhaus Stuttgart, at the Frankfurter Kunstverein. I think he helped create uh, the European mm -hmm. Kunsthalle in Cologne. Um, uh, and he, since it's only been since 2006 that you took over uh, yes. the Rotterdam. Yes. Uh, Avita de Witt, which is a center for contemporary art uh, with a focus on theory and debate and a particular way of running itself. Um, he has, is a, trained as an artist and uh, has also uh, operated a gallery in the 1990s. So please tell us what exact situation you find yourself in and how, think, how, how has the reality changed for you from when you took on this job in 06 to where you are today? Now we increased our budget. Uh, You've increased <laughs> your budget? Yes, we increased our Here budget. Here we are in a crisis panel. Um, we have three people who've increased their budget. Now we are not affected by the financial crisis or the economical crisis mm -hmm. yet. Uh, the, I think the funding, <laughs> as, a, as Coming from Germany, going to a smaller European country, uh, uh, finding there a completely different situation in terms of funding. Uh, in the, in the, yes, so, I think the funding in the Netherlands okay. for this non-collecting institutions um, stems from the belief after the Second World War that the, that <coughs> not the indiv individual is responsible for funding, more the state is responsible for funding. We, are, we rely completely to 100% on public funding, mm -hmm. um, which is also a problem. You can't increase, you know, your, 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 your budget, you know. As it, um, but for the very first time, in the mid or end of next year, the time when the economic crisis started, uh, we, our, our budget, which was given for the period of the upcoming next four years, increased for the very first time in mm. between 18 years. I think that's my impression. There is more in the Netherlands, there is more a political problem than a funding problem, as a political in terms of how, yeah, how these institutions will be funded. In the, they are received as elitist institutions, and the politics uh, getting more and more populist. And this has been going on for a few years in Holland. There's a general perception of Holland as a very, very generous state to the arts, but for the last yeah. five or six years, the country has been in a, a deep debate about these yeah. subsidies and whether they're effective or not. Your subsidies in Rotterdam, they're not municipal, they're, they're national uh, Both support. as a, the, as a two-thirds uh, state, mm -hmm. as a governmental funding, and one-third one. And that will include the new building that you're trying to build? That will yeah, also we are looking forward for a, for a major renovation, not necessarily a new building. Right. But, uh, okay, we need 
10 million euros for that. It's also <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a lot by of the, money. By the way, those of you who would like to see even more of Nicolas, he's going to be back this afternoon in the art lobby, aren't you, mm. also speaking? So this is mm. just chapter one of, of your day. <laughs> Um, mm. Adam, we, we, uh, I spoke with the other panelists and they have promised <laughs> that they won't gang up on you as the only American uh, here. Uh, but certainly having just listened to these uh, very brief uh, comments, I, I perceive that you are indeed living in a slightly different uh, reality. Uh, Adam Weinberg, if there ever was a man who was destined to run the Whitney Museum, it is he. Uh, he has now served under various roles and several stints at the Whitney. He just came back, what appears to be just yesterday, although it was 2003, uh, to run the museum. Uh, he's an art historian, curator, also museum education expert. He uh, ran the Edison Gallery at the Phillips Academy in Andover, was also director of education at the Walker in Minneapolis. Uh, he's also no stranger to Europe. He ran the American Center uh, an institution about which we could have probably a separate uh, panel discussion um, uh, in Paris. Um, uh, I think it's safe to say that Whitney is in the eye of the storm. Uh, you are two blocks away from Mr. Madoff's house, uh, uh, literally, uh, I think. And uh, at the same time, it's of course a major New York institution, also has been for many years planning a building. There's another long story. Um, again, from your corner office at the Whitney and in talking to your fellow museum directors in America, how has the reality changed? Is it similar to this story or is it something quite different? Well, I see, Andres, you've saved the worst for last. <laughs> um, uh, like Ivona, we try to, in theory, would love to spread our risk, and I think that would be the hope of every museum director in America but we get less than 1% of our total support from government sources, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, we have to count on mostly private support um, plus endowment. Our endowment represents about 15 to 20% of our income, but because the investment value of the endowment is down, um, normally we would have drawn about six million dollars, seven million dollars this year, we'll only be drawing a million dollars. So we have to make up five to six million dollars. This is typical for most of the arts museums throughout the United States. Um, and that's what percentage of your total operating budget? Our operating budget is 30 million dollars a year. Um, so it's a quarter? It's about a quarter, exactly. So it's really substantial. Um, there is not a museum hardly in New York that has not cut back, laid off staff, um, and realigned um, their thinking about how to weather uh, the storm. I think most people are hoping, and it's interesting, I feel that actually in New York people are fairly optimistic right now, even though it's been tough. Um, your little quote about um, if you don't have problems, you don't think. Um, in American museums, you always have to think because you always have problems. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, so I think, you know, I think we're always challenged um, uh, and it's just, it's our way of life. And in your particular case, uh, what, what uh, can you just be specific about what, what it has led well, you to do in terms of strategy or the specific decisions? Well, I mean, I, I would say, you know, first of all, um, uh, you know, using the term DNA, one of the other people, maybe it was one again, used the, uh, the notion of DNA. Um, our DNA stems very much from our collection, and we're very fortunate, unlike the two institutions here that don't have collections, um, to be able to rely on using those collections. And um, for example, we just put together a um, significant exhibition in Kleis Oldenburg, 90% um, of which was from our collection. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's quite an extraordinary um, exhibition covering the whole career in a rather um, small amount of space. It's interesting, though, we got um, contradictory reviews of the show in the New York Times. One where they were saying, on the one hand, what a wonderful show, it's great that they're being able to show Oldenburg in a museum which hasn't been done in a while. On the other hand, somebody in the New York Times said, gee, they're doing something on the cheap because they're using their collection. And I actually found that um, as actually a badge of honor in a way because I think mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for us to rethink what we're doing, prioritize, and the core of what we're about is our collections. And, this is um, the classic damned if you do, damned if you exactly. don't, because of course if you had taken the 
Credit Suisse uh, collection of Oldenburg, he would have been roasted alive exactly. for doing that. Exactly. Um, let's, um, uh, well, I think a certain picture is beginning to emerge and we'll get <coughs> more details. Um, uh, certainly it seems that the impacts are different, but I think it's fair to say that uh, in every case, there's room for adjustment and change and improvement. And I also think that it, it's fascinating to see that even in the most pure state-supported uh, situations, there are hybrids em emerging. Even in cities where, which are really quite known for their public subsidies, you already have in place or are working on various kinds of hybrid uh, uh, forms, and I think that is certainly the future. So I'd like us to talk briefly and sort of touch on several areas where perhaps uh, museums could uh, adjust or make the most of their resources. And let's, let's perhaps, uh, you already pointed one right now, which is digging, digging deeper into your uh, permanent collections if you have one. But let's talk about another one, which is collaboration. Uh, clearly, if you're short of resources, uh, one way to make the most of them is to work uh, together. Um, Millions of objects are sitting in crates in warehouses around the world. How could we make more use of them? Rona, I know you have strong feelings about this. Uh, well, because we don't have a collection, we thought we'd borrow other people's because it is true that there are hundreds of works of art that I think of as being like the undead. They're lying in the coffin of the crate in a warehouse, hundreds of warehouses all over the world. And so, because we were able to expand, we thought, well, here's a way of bringing that work back into the public arena. And so, we're going to celebrate public collections and private collections. In Britain, we have three public collections that have no home. And yet, they're bought with taxpayers' money, and they work very hard, but they've never really been you know, shown together. So, that was one, one strategy. Um, another strategy was to kind of use spaces that were a bit dead. And we, like I think all, many of our colleagues, have an auditorium. And uh, this actually happened a couple of years ago in conversation with colleagues like Lars and in actually different parts of the world. We thought these, these black boxes are waiting for an event. Why not use them to show works of art? So we formed a consortium and uh, the work of art is a DVD. And it, so there's no transport costs, there's no couriers, there's no shipping, there's no insurance. And each one of the venues nominates one artist who works in a lens-based media, and that one artist is shown on general release around the world. So it's sort of things like that. It's, it's I guess, trying to get the most out of our spaces and our resources. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we'd love to do in the future, which is much more pragmatic, is the, the shipping of works of art is expensive. It's it has an environmental impact. Could we find some way of creating a database where movements of works are consolidated? You know, there are all these kinds of ideas, I think, that we should be developing. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you say that. I, I think missing infrastructure is one of the things I'd like this panel to focus on. What is it that we're missing that if we had it, we could do it better, but I'd like to ask others here, are you also thinking in this direction, whether national or internationally, to, to do more through collaborations? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, when, when we had the situation where we didn't have a building, a museum building, but we were still a museum, we established something we called Moderna Museet Care Of, which was not the same as touring exhibitions, I mean, making a selection from our collection and touring it and, and sort of generously providing it for somebody else, but actually we basically invited other large and small museums and Kunsthalles, especially in Sweden, for starters, to come with great ideas for our collection. Mm. And then we helped support uh, realizing these ideas. And we did, for a period, we did about six of these projects a year. Now we're down to two a year outside mm. Stockholm. But, you know, we work with all kinds of, of institutions. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you, you lend the work that fits mm -hmm. the place, the history, the... Uh, the system in a sense. And I think that this way of working, uh, of course, we do have all the time by lending to each other. But I do think on another level, if you were starting to do this on an international level, I think you would also probably need to form some sort of n more formalized networks of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So you work so with the same standards. Like, does, anybody here, does anybody here have an idea of what that would look like? 
I mean, I have been uh, talking a little bit with colleagues about about something that I mean, if you, it's maybe it's a too corporate metaphor, but let's think about the airline alliances. Uh -huh. You have some. I mean, you 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 are independent, but you share codes, mm -hmm. so to say, and you you have some systems, established systems of collaboration, which could have to do with both uh, both acquisitions, exhibitions, loans, mm -hmm. and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that that is a level uh, which could work. You have to know each other quite well if you do these sort of loans and exchanges on a, on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. But you, it's still important that you maintain your individuality and, and, uh, and sort of what, are what, what you are. Because we're all about difference, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, museums are always about difference. Mm -hmm. We are different, and that's a key factor in our... Uh, Identity. In the United States, we had for a while something called the Museum Loan Network, uh, which was a consortium of, of, of uh, museums that worked together to make available works for each other. But you needed a, a philanthropic start to that that was initiated by the Pew and other foundations, and unfortunately those foundations stepped away from that. Uh, are there any other models here that anybody can think of? Christine? I think also of this uh, new strategy of sharing uh, purchasings between museums, like more purchases, purchasings, yeah, more like uh, purchasing a works, for example, with three big institutions. The work belongs to the three institutions is uh, sort of becoming a nomadic work. And this uh, is very helpful for very expensive budget for like uh, works we could not buy alone. And that's becoming a natural process now. It's not so much uh, surprising anymore. So it's something that yeah. you do, for example? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we begin to do actually, that. We did it with, um, jointly with uh, Pompidou and Tate with yeah. um, Bill Viola, but we've also exactly. done acquisitions with MACBA, Walker Art Center, um, Albright Knox. Um, we've been doing about two uh, major purchases a year with jointly with other institutions. They tend to be mostly media-based work, though, um, because they don't have quite the wear and tear. So that. Um, and do you have all the relevant legal frameworks in place to manage? I think now this? it's become more standardized. I mean, the contracts are getting easier. Mm -hmm. um, the bigger, biggest issues seem to be around conservation. Um, as much as anything. I mean, the, the two things that I would just say about collaboration is one is I think that the collaborations between collections t tends to work quite well, and I think that that's very, very promising. I think that the whole Bind to Tillman show here, for example, is a, is a wonderful example of two collections coming together to make something else that was probably not terribly expensive to do overall, and, um, and we've done that with other institutions. In fact, Larsh and I have talked about doing that. Um, I think that the idea of collaborations on exhibitions, I find there's a bit of a fallacy there. I don't think that they always end up saving money. I mean, we've mm -hmm. done a wonderful collaboration with the Pompidou with mm -hmm. our Calder and Power show, which has been a great show. The two institutions have been very much aligned. It's been very successful on every front. I'm not sure it saved either institution very much money in the end, mm -hmm. um, because the reality is you're still mm -hmm. shipping the works and creating the works, and maybe it saved a little bit. Um, but you're also putting in a lot more effort because you basically have two teams working on it. So mm -hmm. I think we have to be a little careful because people think collaboration, as they do in the art world in general, collaboration is a great thing. But I think it's too quick to just say collaborate, that's the answer. Yeah, and it doesn't save time. Exactly. Uh, in fact, it so adds it time. It costs a lot of time. Mm -hmm. but for non collecting institutions, we are focusing on co productions of artworks. You know, we are producing a lot of. Yeah, media-based, as a films or, or mm -hmm. videos, etc. Of course, we have to look for cooperation for, 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 for partners producing a piece of, I don't know, for one hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. This is how we cooperate worldwide, and this, yeah, it's, and with catalogs and etc. But again, and I agree, it costs a lot of time and extra personal. I don't think it, you know, it so saves money. Right. Yeah, it's it's creating a larger network. Of course, one of the things you would need to be able to uh, cooperate better and tap into these joint pools of uh, activity would be to have a clearer understanding of who wants to do what. It seems to me that there's a culture in the art world, in the museum world, of keeping things a little bit close to your vest 
there's a kind of a little bit of a culture of secrecy until shows are announced. Um, that seems to run counter to this idea of collaborating more. I see some nodding heads. Yeah, it's, it's quite, I mean, CMAM, which is this uh, organi uh, global organization under ICOM for museum curators and museum directors, basically, and Kunsthalles, actually, these days. And uh, they have just, or just about to launch uh, a website for the CMAM members mm -hmm. where you can uh, post your, the exhibitions where you would like to have a collaboration or partners and so both early ideas and more or less finished packages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's been a quite interesting discussion in the board, for example, around this, because of course, in some cases, it's very obvious and, and you have something that could easily tour. But it also turns out that in many cases, a project is not fit for being announced on a website like that. It needs much more sort of de detailed discussions and so you can't sort of communicate in that way. So we'll see how this will work, but there are efforts also on that level mm -hmm. to, to sort of create But I mean, in this very diversified databases. global museum sphere with thousands of museums, the way we do business is basically still one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. right? So there's no equivalent to what we have in the mainstream economy of, here's a great idea, let's put the word out, let's see who might want to get on board. There are no systems in place for that. I, I just want to raise the... the Issue, do we think that as certainly the financial picture will get worse before it gets better, um, it struck me that actually the, when you said the word global, that the, the ability to bring works of art from different countries, as, as we've now understood the word global, and we have to understand that that is truly, it includes South Asia and, and uh, Latin America and so on and so forth. Is there a danger, do we think, of retracting from that because of the huge expense of travel and research and actually just thinking, okay, well, let's get more local mm -hmm. to try and cope with all this, um, you know, economic downturn. I mean, do, do you feel that that's a no. possibility? No. I think uh, one of the things actually I like at the Pompidou uh, that makes it uh, everyday life better <laughs> Uh, is that we have uh, projects dealing with research on the long term, like two or three years researching and traveling. Like, uh, for example, I, I research during two years in the ex-Eastern Europe countries, going everywhere, and there are other curators doing that in India for a new project or Latin America. And uh, our strategy is to continue to develop this uh, deep research and not, you know, mm -hmm becoming centered. Yeah. But the, the problem is that actually for the touring of exhibitions or for the collections, actually we sell the, the mm -hmm. exhibition or the collection quite expensive mm -hmm. to these countries. And I must say that's the, mar the, the problem of the market nowadays that we have to get uh, incomes. And one of the strategies is to make the collection paid uh, quite mm -hmm. expensive, I must say. Mm -hmm. Lars and Nicolas both. No, I, I, but I do think that the risk you're pointing out, it may not be the case for the Centre Pompidou and maybe not uh, for the Moderna Museum, but I think it's a general problem, I'm sure. I mean, just if museums are, which is a very attractive thing, but a, a very good thing, if they work more with making exhibitions out of the collections, of course, the collections were built during a period when the outlook wasn't that wide, for example, mm -hmm. and of course, if if you have a choice of making an exhibition with an artist from your neighbor country or so, or from another part of the, the other side of the globe, of course, uh, this may suffer. I mean, that's, that's most likely. And of course, it all, may also lead to, the, uh, to if you partner up, if you, if you plan to work with an artist, say, from India or from China, that you're more likely to work with uh, an artist that uh, is, has strong support from the commercial sector, for example, mm -hmm. so, you can get, uh, so you can get a better support than just going out and, and finding someone who doesn't have a strong support yet mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, in the West. Yeah, I want to get back to the commercial problem. Nicholas, you, you wanted to jump in? I mean, yeah, it's a little bit, you know, I'm, I think we sh also should think about the production of art. You know? Well, I, I, I yeah, would, that's, it's, that's it's a, for me, the central or crucial question uh, is more what, how will art production going to change? Prob will it be less affirmative, you know, smaller again? <laughs> you know, it, which 
costs, less, you know, less transport costs, less, less insurance costs, etc. etc. Et well, that, that was that, actually mm. one of my next questions, is whether museums have a certain responsibility here of shaping and guiding where things are going. I mean, I know that on, on, the, on, the, on the art market, mm. you can see very clearly just by walking around the booths of this fair that artists have already adapted mm. their production. Yes, I was just yes. recently in New York visiting with a you know, very well-known internationally acclaimed artist who used to make work, you know, half the size of the screen. Mm. He's now working on watercolors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be wonderful watercolors. I assure you they will be great. Um, is there an equivalency? Is there something similar happening in museums? I mean, Clay Oldenburg doesn't seem to be the uh, paradigm of a scaling back in terms of size, all those. Uh, but even in terms of the projects that we're doing, we, I mean, at least American artists have you know, often been able, you give them a budget, you give them a space, and they often will adapt to it. Not all artists, not every artist can do it, but um, I think that there are always opportunities in that, and spe specifically when you're working with younger mm -hmm. um, artists, there are opportunities, and we do um, a lot of projects like that. We did one with a young artist named Corin Hewitt, mm -hmm. who really um, came up with a, a brilliant project, a laboratory in the gallery itself. Um, uh, which worked really well. We've done some other smaller um, projects. And, you know, I find, to, you know, the relationship between the museum and certain, um, you know, certain museums and certain artists really, um, they create a kind of synergy that makes it possible to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. it happens at PS1 all the time, even though MoMA sits up on top. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, for Alana Heiss, Alana Heiss was always able to get artists to, um, come up with things. I mean, it was often uh, difficult for the artists, mm -hmm. and in the end, it created many problems. But um, there are opportunities in all of this, and I think you know one has to look at those. I, I think we could also look to. It, it's a it's a period where you have to look and listen. And um, I remember going a long time ago to Brazil to Porto Alegre, where there was a big Mercosul Biennale, and um, the curators had nothing. They had no money at all. And so what they did was that they, they had property, they had apartments, they invited artists to come live in the apartment and they gave them each $100. And they had a space and they said, here's $100, go around Porto Alegre, buy what you can and create something with that. And so 10 installations were created, which were extraordinary. And the artists themselves explored the city and they came back and made some very, very interesting interventions into this old warehouse space. And I thought, what a great way of working. There is a huge desire for art based on solidarity and making things with no money. There, there are like three or five new spaces now. And uh, I, I'm very, I had a very beautiful memory of the one space I've seen in Kosovo uh, two or three years ago run by the artist Erzen Skololi during the whole year in Peche. He did a space uh, during five years with one of the most exciting list of artists like Arthur Zmijewski, Pavel Altama. And when I've seen that, I went back to Paris and I opened a space two years ago called Blank with Friends. It's not in the museum because it's not the strategy, but it's about this feeling of going back to what we liked when we were students, like mm -hmm. 20 years ago, and we were not thinking of these huge budgets. I, I know it can sound a bit like, you know, like 68 style, It's a bit but kumbaya, it's really but I mean, true. it's definitely it's really but there's a lot now. to it. I, I, what I want to ask you, though, it seems that both of the previous subjects raised two very important questions. One, uh, how quick, it seems like there's new creative energies inevitably happening yeah, because of, of these transformations. How uh, flexibly can your organizations uh, uh, shape and adapt to conform to this new energy, <clears throat> given that especially bigger museums are like super tankers, it's a little hard to turn them around. Secondly, uh, you've already raised the wonderful uh, questions about collaboration and touring and so forth. How can you get your funders, whether they're state funders who tend to lock you in for four, four years ahead, or philanthropic funders, how can you say to them, look, now we're into little artist spaces, or now we're into touring, now we're into collaboration, Come, you know, join us in thinking in these new ways? I think that it's very interesting what you, what you have just said. You know, uh, for example, Vitz de Vitz 
It's, it's just 20 years old. It's a relatively new institution. What will happen with this, this non-profit, smaller artist spaces now? Do they get institutions in mm -hmm. the future or not? Yeah. You know, this is, uh, that's a very, you know, we, the non-collecting institutions, get more and more institutionalized. We get more and more mm -hmm. money and acceptance. Yeah? Will, the, will there be a kind of a new avant-garde which mm -hmm. will just pass by? Mm -hmm. yeah? Or do we even recognize them mm -hmm. as institutions? I don't know. There well, is a new yeah. generation there is no, coming. Yeah, there is a new generation, mm -hmm. yeah, but is this, will this be recognized uh, by cultural mm -hmm. Will this be recognized by cultural politicians? Mm -hmm. As in Europe, yeah? it's mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. in the US to get funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think this is a good, very good question. I think it's really important, and we, of course, can help to try to yes. make them recognize it. Actually, I think that uh, about your question about flexibility and the ability to adapt. I mean. What we, one of the things we did, what is it now, seven years ago, and in the process after this sort of disaster, which I just came into, um, uh, was that we created a situation where we have a maximum amount of flexibility. As a museum, you have, of, of our type, a museum of modern art, you have to have a planning horizon for some types of project, which is like four years or even more. <clears throat> but we very consciously built in like a a Kunsthalle way of thinking within mm. that institution. So we, we have like, we work in, in two tempi at the same mm. time, mm. and we, we have to have that agility to be able to decide to do something or to change path within half a year or so. Mm -hmm. And in Sweden now, we have a pretty remarkable situation, I think, where I have as a director of this museum, because I have totally free hands to very to very uh, uh, lo long extent. I don't even have a board anymore. It's, it's all in my hands. I have the budget, I have the building, and of course there is a sort of a mission statement, but that's it. Mm -hmm. And then I have an annual dialogue with the Minister of Culture. And so we're given incredible freedom because there's a belief now from the government that this is about individuals also. It's and about the public, but it's about individuals. And as Nicholas points out, this is really a matter of great urgency because these are the moments that you can quickly turn into a dinosaur when suddenly all these other things are happening. Uh, I'm mindful of the time, and uh, three areas I'd like to quickly touch upon before we go to questions. Will the audience allow me to ask a few more questions? Thank you. Uh, they're really all very important. Um, I know, I know, because you, you, you have questions of your own. Can, you, can I get a quick show of hands? Who has questions until now? Oh, good. Then I have more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the one is we've talked about uh, supporting new activity, but uh, this is especially for those of you with permanent collections. The other big question is deacquisitioning, sales of artwork. Now we all know that. Uh, in the United States, the American Association of Museum Directors has clear guidelines about deaccessioning. I paraphrase, you deaccession and we will come down, hunt you down, burn down your house and kill you. That's roughly, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing the, 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 the law here, but uh, there are very, very strict rules against it. On the other side, you have this sort of McKinsey type of consultant uh, mentality that says, here you are, you're struggling institutions, you're sitting on top of works, many of which haven't seen the light of day in generations. Sometimes you have uh, five versions of the same uh, series of works, mm -hmm. uh, lesser works, things that you will never show. Why don't you just sell it? Uh, Adam, you happen to be a proud graduate of a university which recently mm -hmm. Decided to close down its museum and put up uh, its contents for sale, the Rose Museum at Brandeis. Um, given all of that and, and where you are and where you've served, do you feel that uh, the museum sector's approach to deaccessioning is appropriate to our moment? I think we should hunt them down and burn down their house. <laughs> um, I think I th it's a very, very slippery slope because once you start selling a work of art for you know, for the reason of, well, maybe I'll use that money to help repair the museum, or then I'll use it to pay a salary, and then I'll use it for maintenance, then I'll use it for building and grounds, and the next step, you're using it to help support the whole university. And I think that 
the um, art museum directors in America have really kept a very tight mm -hmm. framework on that because it very quickly can shift from the focus on the work of art, and that is why we exist. And um, I mean, just briefly about the Rose Art Museum, that uh, the museum was there almost since the founding of the institution. Um, all of the works uh, were given to the institution that they would be there in perpetuity for a museum and not for the benefit of the uh, greater university. Um, the, even though they've closed the museum, which is very problematic, there is a suit on the part of the state, the state attorney general, that will be lodged to try to prevent them from selling it, which basically means the museum will be frozen. Mm -hmm. So in effect, they've succeeded, and in time, they may be able to sell it. Um, in terms of deaccessioning at the Whitney, um, we cannot uh, deaccession the work of a living artist um, because our job is the artist museum is to protect the reputation of artists. So we can only deaccession a work of a living artist if it is used to then um, uh, increase the holdings or change the holdings of that artist's work. Um, in terms of most historical acquisitions, um, we tend to feel strongly about keeping most things and the things that are would realize any value don't make any sense to sell. Um, it takes too long a process to sell something for $20,000. So um, by and large, it's on rare occasions that we're really deaccessioning works. Is, is it possible, though, that assuming that uh, there will be situations where smaller museums especially get into deep trouble, that there can be mechanisms put in place that would prevent them from deaccessioning and would allow the, the works to, to remain in public collections, but somehow relieve them of some of their financial pressures? Well, the problem is everybody wants that, but nobody wants to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's typical. Um, in fact, there is a law literally being debated this week in New York State trying to control deaccessioning in New York State museums. But even though museums have very strong emotional feelings about it, they don't want it being governed by the state mm -hmm. about how things are disposed of. For example, one of the provisions is that it must be offered to another public institution in the state of New York. And most institutions don't want to be restricted or it might have to be sold through a certain means. Mm -hmm. We don't want those kinds of restrictions, mm -hmm. even though um, we feel that it's a legitimate thing not mm -hmm. for people to be able to dis, uh, uh, deaccession dis indiscriminately for the purpose of sporting. So. What's the view from Paris? Yeah, uh, I want to uh, explain mm -hmm. a bit about our particular system that is very helpful at the moment. Is that uh, first of all we cannot sell the collection? It's in the French law, uh, except uh, except uh, when it's an association. It's a case of our regional fund of contemporary art that is spread around uh, around the 22 uh, regions of France. Uh, but we have also this National Fund of Contemporary Art that was built in the 19th century and the, that is constantly depositing works in museums. So it's a very uh, strong support for the museums who could be in difficulty because they can get a Maurizio Catellan or Felix Gonzalez Torres through mm -hmm. this means. So it's incredible. You can see that in the Musée de Grenoble or in the Musée de Marseille, you have the DS of the Gabriel Orozco. They could have never buy this work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have also this second system called FRAC in regions, and these uh, collections are also uh, loaning and sometimes making deposits. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like an internal, um, uh, s very strong solidarity in France between stage, region, uh, mm -hmm. and the museums. Mm -hmm. All right, let me quickly uh, jump in. That's, that's, uh, that's really good. But what about, what about the other side of this? Uh, Museums have traditionally gotten in hot water, and this is a subject that may interest this audience a lot, w with working with private uh, uh, funders, in including galleries and private collectors. Is there some way to do more of that without leading to more conflicts of interest or more outcries from the press that, we're, that the uh, money, change, money lenders have entered the temple? How, how, is there a new way of regulating that? Yeah. There, there is something new uh, happened with us, and I want to mention it here because it might seem <coughs> look surprising, is that galleries and artists gave works recently. I mean, this can look really surprising, but knowing that, for example, the museum cannot purchase a very expensive work, some artists and galleries made this gesture to give a work. 
And as I told you, it's 50% of our purchasing to get these donations. This mm -hmm. is a huge tradition with our museum. And surprisingly to me, this has increased in the last five years, mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. also with the friends of the museum. Mm -hmm. who have been extremely supportive and they bought like an amazing Anish Kapoor mm -hmm. uh, and we have a very strong help also from the artists uh, on a budget level. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a very strict policy against um, long-term loans from private collectors against. or from yeah. against yes. and, and the reason is basically both personal and the institutional sort of history of of feeling let down many times, that you have a loan, you, you take care of the work, you expose it, you're sort of, and you find out that you've been a great shop window. And in the meantime, you've been paying for the costs of, for, the, for the display as well. And not only is the work maybe sold after five years, ten years, but also uh, um, it sort of creates also a sense of lack if it's been an important work in the collection, a, a sense of missing from the audience side. So, so I think the price you pay for these, these uh, uh, long-term loans means that you have to consider them extremely carefully. And it has to be very special relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, it does happen at the Moderna Museum, but it happens very seldomly. Uh, and then we have on the other side, exactly like at the Centre Pompidou, we have a, we've had a fantastic uh, increase in the amount of, of private patronage and support from so galleries. So financial patronage is okay, and, and you're working hard on... Absolutely, I mean, it, this is... Absolutely. It's not <laughs> ideological. It's yeah. not ideological. It's, it's in a sense, Neutral. it's practical. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's about, uh, I mean, you don't want to sit with, with, with being a, like a fool, mm -hmm. after well, all. I, and you I, tend to end up in that situation, unfortunately. We, we get 70% of the works of art as gifts, which is based uh, largely on tax law in the United States. I mean, one of the um, developments that's happened in the last several years, which has been every, very helpful from the uh, gallery side, is that I find that there are increasingly a number of galleries who when collectors buy the works, they will say, we strongly encourage you. And in some cases, there have been requirements, which I think has been a little bit harsh, and a lot of collectors have been pushing back, mm -hmm. that that work eventually go to a museum. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard a lot of collectors say, gee, I don't want to buy this Paul McCarthy knowing that I absolutely have to give it to a museum. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel that there have been a number of dealers who really have looked out, not just for the museums, but the artists, by saying, here's a major work, it needs to end up in the collection of a public institution, and we are going to make an effort to make that happen. In some cases, for example, at an art fair, where they could sell something for cash right away, they know that there's an institution looking at it, they have a reasonably good chance of getting it in that institution. Some of the dealers are willing to work with that, others are not. It depends on the piece, it depends on the, on the situation, but we in, um, in the U.S. are really dependent on that relationship. Um, in terms of financial, we will take a measure of money, but I think it's, it's set by percentage of the total amount of money for a publication or an exhibition that could come from a gallery source. And like Larsh, we um, have very strict um, uh, rules on long-term loans from any source whatsoever for all the same reasons. Well, uh, we are really, uh, I see now arms are going up. So before we go to questions, I just would like to ask each of you uh, to reflect very briefly. I mean, we've touched on a number of points, although not nearly as many as I would like. Maybe some other points will come out in the question. Uh, but uh, I would like us to sort of have some take home from this. Um, each of you, if, if there's one thing that you'd like to uh, suggest, uh, some kind of innovation, some piece of new infrastructure, some new website, some new organization, anything you like, that if we had this thing, it would make what we want to do easier for us to do, what would it be? Uh, anybody can start. Uh, Christine. I think the major issue now is flexibility. For me, it's becoming more flexible. I'm talking about the Centre Pompidou, of course is that it's about like being an adult, being like 30 years old or more, and, uh, and becoming so big that uh, we don't have this uh, oil anymore in our pipe building. <laughs> uh, 
and we need it now to uh, to adapt to the future. And what, how would you get that? What would what would give you the? But that's that's a big issue because everything tends to make it less flexible. The mm -hmm. new laws for security issues, the new products that are not mm -hmm. uh, that we cannot use because it gives cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, there are so many laws now and this uh, obsession to, uh, for security and for this, because we have more and more public, so that's uh, mm -hmm. somehow paradoxical. Yeah. We need more uh, flexibility, so we are in a huge paradoxical situation mm -hmm. and we don't have the clue how we will get out of this, but this is what we have to yeah. solve in the future. I can see the headlines tomorrow in the press. Chief creator of the Babur calls for more carcinogenic art. Um, uh. Ecological art. <laughs> Actually, it's not a joke, but we, we use ecological painting yeah, for yeah, the no, walls. No, no. <laughs> Ivona. Um, I, I think we have to listen to what our audiences need and want, what yeah. artists need and want. Mm. You know, I think it's, it's a, a, a crucial time to mm -hmm. be receptive mm -hmm. to what's happening in people's lives, what we can offer, mm -hmm. um, because we have to make a very compelling case for culture mm -hmm. at a political level, at a social level. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that if, if uh, we offer our resources in a way that makes sense for people mm -hmm. who might be f facing unemployment or artists who can't you know, find the resources to create a work of art, all of those things, I think, should form the way that we go forward and, and how and we how, how are we going to listen better? I mean, museums, of course, do surveys yeah. all the time. Is there some new way well, one, of listening? One, ex one example was um, to provide um, uh, strategies for survival for artists. Mm -hmm. So we now offer with artists peer critique, talking to each other about how to, what happens when you leave art school, mm -hmm. how do you go forward? Mm -hmm. But also a lot of people saying, we're now, we've lost our jobs, we want to train, we want to educate mm. ourselves, mm -hmm. so we're offering courses. Mm -hmm. okay. And all of our curatorial staff are highly educated, highly mm -hmm. trained people, they can okay. share that knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. So those are two, two examples. Right. Nicholas, what new tools or no, suggestions? I, I, you know, the whole business world is unraveling somehow, mm -hmm. and I think for the art world it could be good. Yeah, it's, I don't see it unraveling at the moment, as from a Euro European perspective. Um, one of the most challenges I hope what will going to happen. Uh, well, I think there is a media crisis at the moment. Ah, that was from, one of from, the questions from the, I didn't from ask. From a European perspective, we had the, ver the last 10 years, uh, the, the so-called quality press shrinked enormously. And where is that potential, that intellectual potential of all that people going to, you know, into blocks or in, uh, I don't know. I think this we have to, we have what you said, Ivona, we have to, to carefully look into the expectations of our audiences, mm. yeah, to not to do what they, give them what they want, yeah. Yeah, but take, take that really serious. Mm. This will be very problematic and not easy, I think. Yeah. But I <laughs> so think the suggestion um, about, uh, this is actually on my long mm. list of yeah. items for today, for museums becoming, mm. providing platforms to, to step strategy. into the shoes of the uh, atrophy, the mm. media infrastructure. Mm. Mm. Adam, what is it that we need um, that if we had it, it would be, the world would well, be a better place? I mean, two things. One is I would agree um, strongly with my colleagues about um, um, listening to artists, but I think also in the United States, um, artists, particularly mid-career artists, are particularly vulnerable right now. Young mm -hmm. artists are used to having nothing, and senior artists, if they've made it that far, they're either successful or they figured out a way to survive. Mm -hmm. And um, we in arts institutions in the United States really bear a measure of responsibility because there is, they're not major means of support. Um, there are a few foundations like the Warhol Foundation and the Paula Krasner Foundation actually have been giving more money away now even though their endowments are lower because they do see a crisis in the situation. So we have a huge responsibility there, I think, in institutions that are supportive. But I think the other thing that, believe it or not, would help is, um, is something that's really boring and dull, and that is support, basic fundamental support for things like insurance and shipping and crating. Those are some of our major um, um, areas, and they are the most unsexy things. No corporation wants to pay for it. There was a time when the airlines were doing pretty well. I remember we used to get in-kind support from Air France, for example, for shipping, and 
Um, but actually, if you look at most exhibition budgets, that counts, accounts for maybe 40% of an exhibition budget. And all of those costs are going up tremendously. So and any visit, insurance people out here who want to yes. start a program, I was or going to say, uh, airlines anybody, people, um, we'll sign you up right now. If there's there. anybody in the audience who'd like to write a check, the uh, panelists would be happy to meet with you. Lars, uh, you get the last uh, thought. Yeah. I mean, I also agree about the fact that, I mean, we have to remember all the time that what, what we're doing is really negotiating the space where, where the artist, the art, and the public meets. It's about excellence and access, in a sense, and I mean, we have to think about that all the time. But I would like to propose, since you sort of asked for gadgets, almost, that we... Yeah, sort gadgets of, uh, uh, and, and, I mean, one, one thing that I've seen that I think is, is wonderful in the last year now is... is uh, that other values than market values have come back in, in the world of art. And also in media, how media writes. I mean, I, I do agree with Nicholas about the sort of lacking of platforms for, for intellectual discourse, but the reporting about art has shifted a little bit. And, and uh, I would like, you don't see these top 100 lists where they all have to do with the role you have in the auction system and, and in, in sort of triggering higher and higher auction results. You know, these lists are, have been gone for half a year or a year. And I would like to have a gadget which gives a slight electric shock to every journalist who sort of <laughs> goes back to making those lists to maintain other values, the values that are more intrinsic, really, to art. Right. That's well, that sounds like a great, a great gadget. Um, uh, maybe Steve Jobs, when he comes back uh, for, to Apple, yeah. he can provide it for us. Okay, we'll take some questions. There is a roving microphone. Be, be, remember, uh, we're being taped, so if you can please identify yourself and ask your question. Or yeah, one, one question I have. There's not only like a job layoffs in the financial sector, there's a strong job layoff also in the cultural sector, because mm -hmm. specifically these institutions are vulnerable. I know, for example, like in New York and Berlin, many galleries had to lay off people. There's more and more curatorial courses with young curators who might not have jobs. You mentioned the artists, etc. On the other side, there's a major audience who also now has maybe more time. But the institutions are so expensive, they can't afford very often to have voluntary arts like in the past. And um, how, do, how do you address this as institutions? I mean, on the one side, the responsibility for research, giving access to a major audience that they can come in. I mean, galleries are for free. I know many young artists in New York, they go to the galleries, they see good quality shows, but they can't afford the entrances to the museums. So how do you address that to guarantee access and a continuation also for the education and the maintenance of a younger generation? Who would like to take the question? Well, I mean, I can answer. I, I mean, the, the simple answer is, of course, to fight for free entrance. We've had it. We lost it. I mean, we didn't have it for 40 years. We had it for five years. We haven't had it for the last five years or so. Does anybody and of here course, have it's free great. Entrance? Free entrance is great. Yeah. You have it. You have free entrance. Yeah. 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 On Sundays, yeah. I mean, I would hope, actually, that the um, national museums should offer it. Um, uh, we don't get any government support. I wish we could do it in, in a heartbeat. I would love to have free entrance. Um, this, all the Smithsonian museums in Washington, D.C. all have free entrance, but um, it is increasingly a problem in New York. It's very expensive to go to I'd museums. I'd like to point out, though, that people always look to the government for free entrance, and many uh, cultural institutions in the States have uh, looked to private benefactors. Right. Uh, so the Metropolitan Opera being a good example uh, has really uh, completely transformed its audience base to one major benefactor who gives out cheap tickets, That's especially right. for young people. Uh, another question? Yes, at uh, microphone. I'm the director of uh, an art museum from uh, Transylvania region in Romania. Um, do you believe that it's the time to identify new strategies in attracting uh, donors and sponsors in a long term? Uh, do you believe that there are new strategies needed in identifying sponsors and donors over the long term? I, I think we should look at um, Obama, actually, who, who generated a huge uh, sum of money through thousands of small donations. Yeah. And I think that's the way forward. 
because everybody's having to kind of, you know, marshal their resources. And I think that if every, we've just launched a campaign for 10,000 give 10 pounds, you know, and we can thank them in a particular way. And that, you know, I think that's probably the way forward is lots of small gifts. Yeah. These are mainly individuals? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I think that it's a moment, by the way, that many museums are in the midst of relaunching their web presence. It was one of the discussion topics I wanted to raise because that uh, uh, online build-out is perhaps as important of a challenge as any that we've mentioned today. Uh, but the fundraising departments, of mo if, if there's one part of most museums which is still very much in the 20th century or in some respects the 19th century, it's uh, development. And nobody really has figured out how to raise significant amounts of money online, but it's undoubtedly part of the future. Uh, do we have any more questions? Yes, over here, and there's one over there. Could we get the microphone? We'll take two more after this. I'm Carolyn from the United States. I have a question for Mr. Weinberg. Um, it seems that a lot of countries really support the arts, and our government doesn't. Do you see that changing anytime soon? And what can we do to, to change it? Well, I have to say, I mean, the one very heartening thing is the Obama administration has been clearly very pro-culture. Um, Michelle Obama came to New York, met with all of the heads of the cultural organizations in a very, very small group setting and talked with them about the hopes that they have. Um, they've been um, installing contemporary art in the White House, which is great, which I don't think has been done in probably a long time. Um, you know, there's been floated a lot the idea of having a culture minister, um, which I think is a terrible idea. I don't think it's our model. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the U.S. had a great model when the National Endowment for the Arts was at its height, um, which I'm sure you remember, when we had individual artist grants. And you look back at the individual artist grants that happened over a 25-year period from the time of the 70s up until the end of the um, 90s where things were... And there was terrific government support being filtered to artists in particular, but also to institutions to a greater degree. So I think the thing to do would be to rejuvenate um, the National Endowment for the Arts. I mean, it was basically decimated under the culture wars in the 1990s. So how do you rebuild that? Um, it's very political, and right now there's no money for it, but I think that's the way forward. Lars? I think it's also, also important to remember that actually there is uh, a state subsidy to the arts in, in the U.S. through the, the tax, tax deductions. Rate. And mm -hmm. the value, the total value of the tax deductions in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is huge it's and probably exactly. can be the equivalent of the typical uh, uh, tax support uh, in, in a European country. It's just a question of where the decision-making sits. Mm -hmm. Does it sit in, in the government? Or does it sit with the private individual donor? And so it's a different model, but actually there is a big support yes, there is. indirectly. That's, that's correct. And just as every U.S. Uh, institution yeah, head is looking for more government, government support, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say every European museum director would like to see tax uh, deductions for donations. No, it's uh, not everybody the same. It's completely, you know, as if you compare Germany and the Netherlands. Yeah, the, yeah these are two worlds. Mm. Yeah. Yes, mm. and, and, and yeah. most governments are, are reassessing these issues yes. everywhere you look right now. Uh, there was a gentleman over there in the second row. We seem to be getting more questions as we go, which is good, although our time is running out. Please. My name is Bjarne Lavoga, and I represent the Corporate Art Program. Uh, I was uh, meaning to ask the panel uh, whether they have any experience about the renting of work out from collections to places outside the institutions, and whether or not such an idea would be her heretical in any way. Well, now, we ha I have an experience when we were at the, uh, when I was director of the Louisiana Museum, it was an attempt to do that. And of course, what you're doing is that you're normally renting to an, an environment that is not controlled in the way uh, environmentally and so forth, like the museum, which means that there are only certain works that can be lent. And you, it turned out to be a, a disappointment game that those who were coming to, to rent and look at the work that would, would be available was, of course, they were looking at work they didn't want, basically, because it was far down in the basement and not your Picassos and Matisses and whatnot. So because, of course, most of these, the recipients are 
even if they're banks and so they don't have the climate, they don't have the sort of system to take care of the work that they would like to borrow. So I think it's a very difficult area to move into. I don't, I don't think there's a future in it, but historically in the United States, a number of museums, they had what were called corporate loan art programs. The Whitney had one up until about 15 years ago where there were a certain category of works that could be loaned to high-level um, high um, do corporate donors, and that existed at a number of museums around the country. It was ended as a practice by the Association of Art Museum Directors about 15 years ago, but in fact, I mean, it's a very interesting history. There is a whole, and it wasn't really so much for the purpose of money, but there were museums all over the United States that rented for a nominal fee works on paper and other art, artworks to get the works out into the public zone. And there are even universities today, like uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that continues to offer students to borrow works from their museum in a category. So you're talking really about for financial reasons. I don't think that's going to happen. There was one more question. Uh, uh, somebody was, uh, had a hand up right here somewhere. OK, let's take this lady in the front. I'm from the Royal Museums of Fine Art in Brussels as a curator there. We just opened our Magritte Museum, which is quite extraordinary because the funding came last year in February before the big crash. And it's a mécénat de compétence, we call it. So it was 2008, it opened just a week ago, 14 days ago. But about tax deductions in Belgium, indeed, it's very rare that we get um, Fund, funds and, and works of ours. And what we have seen more and more in Belgium, which is a very small country, is that collectors open their own museums, and those are large spaces built by very important architects. And we have more and more, I would say, la concurrence, rivalry, from these personal museums. I don't know if you have the same, um, something that happens in your country. Is this trend towards collections, uh, private collections, partly having to do with your comment about the increasingly brittle way that the museums are functioning? Uh, I mean, uh, yes, it happens in Sweden, it happens in Norway, it happens in, in many places. But also, this is how many of the now public institutions started once upon a time. Uh, I don't know the details of the Whitney Museum, but, or, but you know, I mean, they, they start like that. Many of the, the, the great institutions we have today started like that. So I, I don't think we should f have any fear about this. I think it's fantastic. I, I actually, I'm a little bit slightly contrary to that, Lars. Yeah. I mean, in that I do think that a lot of them do, uh, institutions do start off that way, and I would not want to see them disappear. I would say in the United States, we've seen a huge drain of support for institutions going to private museums. Um, and, I, and just for the record, which I'm actually something we're very proud of at the Whitney, is Mrs. Whitney did not want to start a museum. She actually, her intention was to donate her collection to the Metropolitan Museum and give a million dollars to build a new wing. And before the director could even get the offer for the million dollars, he said, we have enough of that American garbage in the basement, which we'll never show. So the only reason the museum was founded, but actually the Frick and many other museums obviously were founded that way. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little ambivalent about it, I have no, to no, say. No, well, no. Uh, well, I've also been in a situation where there is a private museum founded in London, and guess what? They're suddenly running out of money, so guess what they're applying for? Public subsidy, they're applying to trusts and foundations, and so suddenly we're in competition. So I'm very skeptical about some of the basis of it, which seems to me about actually, you know, enhancing the value of their holdings, but then inevitably yeah. uh, competing against other public institutions. I was given permission to allow one bonus question, and I know there were several hands here. Uh, how about here? Uh, microphone. And this is it. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Claudia Petzold. I'm a New York City-based art advisor. And thank you so much for this panel. It was very informative. Um, my question is, we so far focused mostly on questions of organization and management. Um, and to just get back to that quote we heard at the beginning, that a time of crisis is a time for thinking, are there also um, major reconsiderations as to the content of what is displayed. I know that the Centre Pompidou has decided to now retell the history of art through works by female artists. Are there other initiatives along those lines planned? 
I think this has nothing to do with uh, crisis. <laughs> mm. This is our mission since uh, 30 years, and uh, I would not, I would not like to think that because it's a crisis, we, we begin to think. You know, it would be <laughs> disaster for us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, w what I mean is that, of course, I, I, I'm more going in the sense of Ivona when she said that we are more. Uh, responsible ethically, I would say, toward what's happening in the uh, in a social and political level in the country, we should have always been actually, but now it's a more strong responsibility in terms of what we are doing, and some things are not possible anymore regarding the situation of uh, the social crisis in France. Now it would be uh, I, I, uh, insulting to, well, to the public. You, so I some. Somehow, it's, we are in a new uh, thinking about how to save costs and always looking for saving money. And that was not so much the case before. I think it's more sane, actually. It's I, like think, I think we have arrived at the perfect moment of conclusion. A sense of ethical responsibility is certainly one thing we can uh, take home from this period of crisis. Obviously, the conversation could last uh, for a long time. Uh, the other thing is we have seen that reality is always more complex than we imagine it to be. And let's hope that the solutions will be as smart as our panelists were today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for coming. And enjoy the rest of your time in Boston. <laughs>